Okay, so welcome to Restoring Ancient Grasslands in the Upper Willamette. This is, uh, I want to say, the fifth now workshop or sixth now workshop in the Pacific Northwest Forest Collaborative's annual workshop series. Um, much like last year, we've switched to virtual, and so we are hosting about two, one to two, maybe a couple more workshops per month. We started in April with a with a kickoff, and we're going all the way through the end of October. Um, before I move on, I want to take a quick moment and thank all of our sponsors, um, in particular our silver sponsors, uh, Hampton Lumber, the Northwest For Fire Science Consortium, the Forest Service, Timberlane Lodge. Um, quickly go to the next slide. All kinds of technical difficulties today. Um, so due to the large number of attendees, we ask just a few things. Please keep yourself muted until otherwise instructed. Use the chat box to ask questions. Um, and speaking of that, while I'm going through these, if you could just take a moment, it should be, um, it should be restricted right now and introduce yourself to everyone. Um, your name, maybe your location and organization. That would be great. Let's see. Also, please keep your video off unless otherwise instructed. We'll have our session leads keep their video on and their, and their audio on. Um, but everyone else, if you could keep that off at least until the very end of our webinar, um, it just helps limit distractions. Finally, it, I know that we um, are unable to meet in person and such a big part of this workshop is to network and talk to one another. So if people are interested at the very end of this session, um, we will leave the Zoom on for about 20 minutes and I'll let you um, choose your own breakout room. So you'll see a little announcement come up that says, please choose a breakout room and you're welcome to um, pop into one and talk with each other as long as you want within that 20 minute window. Um, I, I think of these as like bumping into each other in the hallway after the session. So they won't be facilitated. You'll be able to talk freely amongst each other um, and just kind of, you know, see who's there and catch up. Um, and that's, you know, that's really how we try and create engagement on these sessions. Um, since there are restrictions around the chat box and keeping your video off, we do want to make sure you have a moment to say hi to one another. So with that, I'm going to pass this over. Oops, sorry for my loud dog in the back. Um, everything's going wrong this morning. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Sarah Altima's Pope. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone, and um, welcome. Uh, we're excited to have this conversation with you today and share about some important work um, that's being done on the Willamette National Forest. Uh, my name is Sarah Altimus Pope, and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Willamette Forest Collaborative. And we have three presenters today that are going to talk about this work that we're doing here on the southern end of, of the Willamette. I'm going to have them introduce themselves when they get to their um, section of the presentation. So we do have a slideshow we want to share with you. Um, we're going to try and keep it to under an hour so we can have half an hour of question and answer. Um, I am going to ask that everybody hold their questions until the end. And I do believe you'll be able to insert your question with a question and answer feature. Sally and I will help moderate those. Um, and yeah, so we'll get started. So first I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. We're having technical difficulties today for sure. <laughs> But uh, let's see if we can get here first. And I'll go to present. And I'm hoping everybody's seeing my screen. Does that look good? Yep, that looks great. Okay, great. And we'll start with our first presenter who is Bart Johnson. And Bart, you tell me, um, oops, when you want me to do next slide. And Bart, you should be able to come off of mute. And I'm going to see if I am, if it's possible for me to pin you. I think I'm off of mute now. Sorry about that. My apologies for being late and having technical difficulties today. So I'm really delighted to join you all today. I'm, I'm Bart Johnson. I'm a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Oregon. And I have been working on the Jim's Creek project since about 2003, back when Jane Curtis, uh, Jenny Lippert, and I teamed together following the work by Tim Bailey up there. So I've been, my perspectives have been evolving over time and I'm glad to share them with you today. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to have to, after this first set of slides, I'm going to have to share a screen so someone can make sure I can do that when I get to the second set because I'm unable to upload it. I think it's too big for the server. So I wanted to start out with a disclaimer here and that is that I'm going to talk about some things 
things I think I know quite a bit about and I feel very confident in. And I'm going to talk about some things that I don't know so much about. But after doing this for 25 years now, I guess I'm really searching for what I think are some of the important ideas and answers there. And so keep going back to that last slide, please. And so the disclaimer is, if we knew what we were, was we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. So I'm gonna go out on some limbs today and I hope you'll bear with me and maybe it'll generate some discussion. But I also wanna note that actually Albert Einstein didn't say this, despite the fact he'd been quoted by numerous people in the literature. So I will try not to be quite so apocryphal in mind. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce this idea of what do we mean by ancient grasslands? Next slide. One of the first things is certainly in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere, that grasslands are typically characterized by mollusols. They're soils that are developed from below ground and above ground grass development over long periods of time, typically these black soils like you see on the left there. And I want to note that part of what they develops them is these incredibly deep and varied root systems of many of our prairie species. And you can see California oak grass, one of our bunch grasses there on the right. Next slide. So mollusols are distributed uh, throughout the world, but primarily in the Asia to Europe steppes and then in North America. And what I want to look at is in the middle of that slide there, you can see some of the vague outlines of some yellow on the inland valleys of the Pacific Northwest. And if you look over to the right, left further to the left, you see three inland valley ecoregions, which are really characterized by historically having quite a bit of prairie and oak savanna distributed within them. And those areas of mollusols on the right are some of the largest concentrations of those prairies and grasslands. So they've been there long enough. One reason they're ancient, they've been there long enough to develop these prairie mollusols. Next slide. But how long is that really? And so this is a Willamette Valley human occupation and oak savanna occupation timeline. It notes that the evidence is that prairies and oak savannas established somewhere between 12,000 and 8,000 years BC and that at least 8,000 years ago, Native American people were also here in the landscape. And so when you click, go ahead and click there, I want to take that last little bit of that timeline of oak and human occupation and blow it up and note that on the very far right there, you see the period of time in which the Society for Ecological Restoration began in 1985, uh, at a meeting in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which I was here to attend. And to note that when we think about our attempts to restore these ancient grasslands, that we've had about two generations of practitioners. Whereas if you acknowledge that indigenous peoples have been managing these places throughout much of their time here, that they have perhaps 200 generations of experience in how we manage these things. And that's gonna set up a lot of what I wanna talk about today and the challenges we're facing, I think. Next slide, please. So some of the evidence for this ancientness of the oak and oak taxa, you see here some paleo data uh, created from uh, cores, sediment cores. And you see here, this is battleground up just north of Portland across the Columbia. And you can see this proliferation of Quercus savanna taxa, both Quercus and grass species from about 11,000 years to 4,000 years ago, really the height of the peak of the oak success in our region. Next slide, please. So I wanna look both back, but also look forward here. These are some reconstructions from paleo data of temperature and precipitation in North America, beginning 11,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and then the present. And the point is, is that the Pacific Northwest climate has been both hotter and drier during these periods of, of oak occupation in the past than it is in the present. And so if we take that into the future and ask ourselves, what's the potential role of these ancient grasslands in the future? Next slide. We need to look to some projections for how, for instance, oaks may do in the future. I do not believe in most of the bioclimatic envelope models we see. If you don't want that is, that's all right. This is a model though, that we're going to show of oak distribution under 35 different variables and projecting into the future. So on the left, you see the current distribution of Gary Oak, Quercus Gariana. Next slide. And this is their projections of what is likely to happen to the ranges of Quercus Gariana under four different climate models at three different time periods. And the main message up there is in those two larger P images there. 
where it suggests that under even the most extreme future climate model, it's quite likely that Quercus feriana will do better and expand its range within the Northwest. Seems like a pretty good bet for hot, dry times. So I wanna give you here three propositions to set up at least my part of the talk. And I want to acknowledge that Sarah and um, Molly and James and I have worked together and talked a lot, but they're not responsible for or guilty of any of the things I'm going to propose to you here, though I think they may agree with some of them or if not all of them. But the first proposition I have is that oak savanna grasslands have been in the Pacific Northwest for a long time, and they're likely well suited to future climate because of the resilience to and tolerance of heat, drought and fire. They're likely to be good for the future. It's a good bet. Next slide. The second proposition I want to make is that the histories of oak savanna grasslands have been long linked to those of indigenous people. Certainly this has been made by many practitioners, whether they are uh, contemporary scientists or Native American scientists or Native American people themselves. And some of the evidence we have for these are this is some work on the left there of my colleagues, uh, Mike Cowthlin and Kelly Durr, her name is somehow obscured there, where they've actually reconstructed what appear to be pre-Euro-American trails, or at least evidence of historic trails, based on general land office maps and other sources. The point here is that you notice that these trails that were here at the time of European-American settlement are blanketing much of the upper Willamette here. The, that network of trails in yellow on the lower part of that slide is right around Jim's Creek. There's a little red blob in there, which is the Jim's Creek site. Second, we have evidence of persistent sites. The upper slide there or upper image is a Packard Creek campground. It's on the upper Lamet about uh, 20 miles from Jim's Creek. It's known as a village site that probably has been occupied for thousands of years. And for the reason that once people turned it into a campground for current contemporary uses, they continue to mow around the oaks. You still see the oaks there. And in fact, if you replace those young children and perhaps their dress and the people are camping there with different colors of people in clothes, you might well have a scene that could have been taken 4,000 years ago. Persistent places of oaks that have been here for a long time that are coincident with um, certain forms of indigenous management. And then we also see the legacies of care in the landscape ranging from that very, very uh, monoculture bare grass meadow on one of these ridges along one of those trails that we were at last summer. Bear grass, of course, known for its basket making uh, uses. And then also a culturally modified tree that James will talk about much more about that we see at Jim's Creek, which is evidence again of indigenous use. Next slide, please. The third proposition I wanna make that I'll build to later in my part of the talk is that the care, attention and sophistication we see in indigenous people's processing of grassland goods and services was likely matched by that or their management activities. There's a lot of controversy out there in the scientific literature about the degree to which indigenous people were managing large areas or small areas intensively, extensively, how much they control the distribution of the savanna grasslands. And I'm not gonna to try to wade into a lot of that today, but I wanna note that any culture that has the capacity to make this kind of care and extraordinarily well-crafted goods and services from the products of those oak savannas and grasslands probably was just about as good at managing them. And that 200 generations of management gives you a lot of skill in how you do that, that may be very important to us as we try to move forward to restore some of these systems. Next slide. And my last slide for this first part is just to show you some of the flavors of prairie and savanna grassland across the Northwest. They are very similar in some ways, but a lot of differences. We've been conducting studies across most of these sites, ranging from those in the Pacific no lowlands to the central and southern Willamette Valley and down into southern Oregon. And there are characteristics that are represented at Jim, Jim's Creek, including areas of grassland on deep soils, those on rocky outcrops, those near water resources, and then those what I call matrix oaks that are out in these very productive sites. So with that sort of overview to thinking about Jim's Creek and thinking about the Rigdon and the context of the larger Pacific North savannas, I'm gonna turn it over to Molly. Great, thanks, and Molly, I'm going to hand it to you and just tell me when you're ready for the next slide and if you could start with the introduction, that'd be great. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good to see you virtually. My name is Molly Julera. I'm the district ranger on the Little Fork Ranger District. Um, I started off as the botanist on the Little Fork Ranger District in 2007 and 
uh, right when the Jim's Creek project was being implemented and have worked uh, with Bart a lot since then and more recently with James. So um, we're kind of going to be going back and forth and who's presenting. I'm going to just give a little um, grounding and, and where we are for those of you who might not um, be familiar. So the Middle Fork Ranger District is on the Willamette National Forest, which is that green blob there in the state of Oregon. And we are in the southernmost part of the Willamette National Forest. Next slide. The mixed conifer forest, um, where the, the areas that Bart was talking about, Jim's Creek and Rigdon, is in the southern part of the Middle Fork Ranger District. So um, kind of a circle, a circle there of where most of that mixed conifer forest is, is concentrated. Um, and that is a character, a characteristic of that is uh, Doug fir, uh, incense cedar, ponderosa pine, sugar pine, and, and white oak. Next slide. So Bart covered some of this, um, the historic conditions of, of these kind of forests as, um, as researchers and, and um, old aerial photos and uh, general land maps and um, Native American stories have told us are open mixed conifer forests, um, trees in these drier areas more widely spaced with an um, understory. Um, this landscape was maintained by frequent fires, which we'll hear more about. Um, and, and also probably um, lighting by indigenous people. Um, we're talking mostly about the uplands today, but these areas also are um, on the Middle Fork, uh, have cold, clear streams and wide floodplains um, with habitat for uh, salmon and bull trout. Next slide. So, so the Jim's Creek project, um, I like to show this, this picture of, of Tim Bailey, the fellow there in the bottom slide. Um, he was a silviculturist and out exploring the new part of, of this district. Um, and he saw this, these large dead oaks um, and some live ones and started poking around a little bit and, and looking around this landscape and um, realizing that that dense forest that you see in the left-hand slide there um, was actually once a very different place. Next slide. So um, I think this aerial photo really shows um, a good example of, of the Jim's Creek area before and after. So Jim's Creek is about 400 acres and it was, um, picked as kind of a pilot project in this mixed conifer area. And so the slide on the left is before and you can see the dense trees and then there's a slide after uh, treatment. And I believe Bart might have a slide that shows a historical photo of it looking um, more like the after. So um, just a, a good example of uh, patterns on this landscape. Next slide. So the Jim's Creek timeline, um, just to let you know how, how things kind of happen. Um, in 2001, there was a, a loose collaborative group was developed. So people that were interested in this mixed conifer forest. Um, and there were a lot of meetings and, and field tours. Some of you may have been on. Um, and the research community, including BART, was really interested in this. Um, in this area, broader oak distribution than many people were aware of. And um, this team started developing some restoration objectives. Uh, we signed that environmental document, uh, environmental analysis document in 2006 and implemented the project, um, that project 2007 through 2010, um, which included uh, logging, um, piling and burning and some seeding. Um, we were lucky that um, before it started, BART was able to put in some, some transects, um, and then we were able to complete some post-treatment monitoring. Um, and then in 2017, we completed an analysis document to actually underburn in the Jim's Creek area, because that wasn't included in the first analysis. 
Um, in 2019, we were able to burn the northern half of Jim's Creek. And, um, and then we were able, Bart was, did some post monitoring in Jim's Creek in 2020. So um, it's been quite the journey. And I think we've learned a lot um, on the way, um, which we'll hear more about today. Next slide. The other project that we've done in this area is called the Pine Grass Project. Um, and this is a project in young pine plantations. It's about 1,600 acres. Um, these are areas that, um, as, as Tim and others were looking around the Rigdon uh, landscape, that mixed conifer landscape, they saw a lot of these areas where the pines were stocked really heavily and there wasn't a lot of understory. Um, and so we've been working on this for quite a few years, um, doing non-commercial treatment. Um, so, you know, not selling any of the logs, but just cutting and piling them and, um, and burning the piles. And we've seen really great response. Um, we've done this with mostly with grants um, from Rocky Mountain Milk Foundation, Oregon Hunters Association, um, the using funds from the Good Neighbor. Neighbor Act uh, revenue. And there's some pictures here of the ODF crew just, uh, just a few weeks ago out at one of the pine grass units. Um, we've had a lot of volunteers and, and youth crews out um, doing this work. So um, this, is, this has been an interesting project in that region landscape as well. Next slide. So we've been uh, throwing around the term Rigdon and Jim's Creek a lot. This is, this is what we call the Rigdon landscape. Um, Rigdon was a whole separate um, ranger district, which got absorbed into the Middle Fork Ranger District. But this Rigdon landscape is where the concentration um, of this mixed conifer dryer forest is. So it, um, it's a, it's a very uh, complex landscape. It's not just the dry conifer forest. There's also um, wet forests, um, high elevation, um, and you can just kind of see the layout of the land here. And we'll talk about that more as we move forward. And I think I'm gonna pass it off to James now. Yeah, we'll hand it to James. And James, if you want to do a quick uh, introduction of yourself first, that'd be great. Okay, let me know if you can't hear me. My name's James Johnston. I'm a research associate at Oregon State University. I've been really lucky, my lab group and I, to get to work with Sarah and the Southern Willamette Forest Collaborative on a project funded by the Oregon Department of Forestry to use dendroecological techniques to reconstruct historical fire regimes in that upper middle fork Rigdon landscape that Molly was just talking about. Next slide. Dendroecology is tree ring research. We take samples of dead wood. Here's an example of some of our work on the upper middle fork site. Next. What we're looking for when we sample um, Go back one, Sarah. There's some animation here. So if I say next, just click a button. And uh, what we're looking for are these features indicated by the arrow in the case of our work in the upper middle fork. Those are fire scars. Next. Here's a closer look at those fire scars. This is nothing more or less than a low intensity fire that killed a portion of the tree's cambium. Um, the, the tree subsequently healed over that wound much the same way your skin will hopefully heal over a wound that you suffered. Next, and next, and next. Uh, because Western conifers like ponderosa pine are hydroclimatically sensitive, meaning they lay down narrow rings in drought years and wide rings in wet years. Those patterns of wide and narrow rings leave a characteristic pattern, much like human fingerprints uh, 
such that we can assign to each of those fire scars a calendar year next. And we can calculate among other things, a mean fire return interval or the average time between fires, which is a really important determinant of how these forests developed over time. Next slide. Next and next. Molly already acquainted you with this area, but here's another view of it in the context of Oregon. That upper middle fork, Willamette, Rigdon site. Is it the headwaters of the Willamette River, which most of us live next to? Next slide. Next. Here's a view of that landscape, that long sinuous feature in the left and bottom of the screen is the middle fork of the Willamette River. You can see Hills Creek Reservoir to the north and you can barely see the town of Oak Ridge. And in the lower left here, that Jim's Creek area that Molly already described. Next slide. So here's another overhead view of that same site and to reconstruct historical fire regimes of this area, we uh, established 16 different data collection sites, roughly evenly spaced in that area. Next slide. Here's what they look like. The exact location of these sites needed to be jittered a little bit to avoid private land, but it's a roughly evenly spaced systematic grid. And at each of those sites, we searched around for dead wood and collected that fire scar data that I described in previous slides. Go to the next slide. And let me describe just how frequent fire was in a wide variety of these different sites. These sites relatively close to the river that I circled here we're all historically dominated by open ponderosa pine or oak savannas. Next slide. And I've broken these up into two basic categories. The first is these dry pine sites where the most outstanding features are these residual pines, which are pretty widely spaced. These pines are typically 200 to 500 years old. Um, there's a lot, a lot of younger Douglas fir that is infilled in these stands. So they look like a proper forest today, but were you to remove all the younger Douglas fir, all the older trees in this stand, you'd be left with a pretty uh, widely spaced open forest. Next slide. And mean fire return intervals, that is the average time between fires between the 1600s and the end of the 1800s when fire was excluded from these sites was about nine years, which is very frequent fire, very typical of what you'd get in Ponderosa Pine Forest of Eastern Oregon or Southern Oregon, but not at all what you'd expect in the Western Oregon Cascades. Next slide. Here's the second type of dry pine site that we've encountered up there. And the only difference is, is that these sites also have quite a bit of oak structure. In this case, what you're seeing is dead oaks on the ground. They've been overtopped by Douglas fir. Douglas fir is, this young Douglas fir has taken over these stands and is, is killing off the oaks and the pines. Next slide, next. And we've reconstructed mean fire return of intervals in these stands of in this site, it was five years. In other sites, it's as little as three years. So incredible tempo of fire in these sites that we attribute to Native American management for hundreds of years prior to exclusion of fire and the removal of Native peoples in the 1800s. Next. There's just an awful lot of signs of indigenous management of, the, of these areas. Here's uh, some more view of oak groves in this area. These oak groves are quite extensive in that middle fork landscape. They're found over an area that's greater than 15,000 acres in size. So it's potentially a very large uh, 
area that was burned frequently and intensively managed for foodstuffs, hunting opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Throughout this area, again, over an area in excess of 15,000 acres, we see hundreds of examples of these trees. These are culturally modified trees, um, trees in which native people removed bark and harvested the cambium. And you still see extensive evidence of that type of management throughout this area. Next. Moving uphill and into some moisture and more productive forest types, I've circled three sites that I think are, well, what I call dry mix conifer. Historically, they had ponderosa pine, but also Douglas fir, grand fir, sugar pine, incense cedar. Next. Here's an example of what these stands look like today. And I apologize, I'm in sort of a noisy place. I probably should have planned better, but hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Very little ponderosa pine in, these, in this stand. It's mostly Douglas fir and incense cedar next, but still historically very frequent fire, uh, probably because these sites are found immediately adjacent to those dry pine and oak sites. These sites historically burned every 14 years. Next. Finally, moving uphill into the most productive Douglas fir, Western hemlock, old growth stands. Next slide. We're able to use a chainsaw again to remove parcel cross sections from old stumps. Next. and click on the button one more time. And you still see evidence of historical fire and these fire scars, those features. Next, here's what those features look like when they've been sanded and polished. Next, and cross dated so that we know which year, in which years fires burned. Next slide. This is classic old growth Douglas fir Western hemlock stand but even in these stands, which we often assume, ecologists often assume go hundreds of years without fire next, we see evidence of really frequent fire, again, potentially because fire was being exported out of those dry pine sites that were being managed by native peoples. One more slide, I think. I think that there's tremendous potential to continue to use these dendroecological methods to reconstruct long, records of succession and disturbance in these stands. And with that, I'll turn it back to Sarah, looking forward to some discussion and questions later. Thanks, everybody. All right, great. And we're going to hand it back to Molly. All right, uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So um, I think as you listen to, to Bart and James talk, they really um, explain what a complex landscape this is. Um, as a district, as we thought about what to do after Jim's Creek, we know we wanted to focus on this, this area that, um, that had some very clear restoration goals. Um, and we decided to do what's called a facilitated landscape uh, analysis design. And I, I think um, there's some quotes here um, I like the one from, from somebody on our, our planning team says, if you don't see the whole puzzle, if you don't see the whole puzzle, you don't know you're missing uh, pieces. So we can move on to the next slide, Sarah. So this, oh, the previous one, there we go. So uh, we call this FLAD for short because we like acronyms, but um, really what we do as part of this landscape analysis and design, uh, we modified it a little from one that the hood had done, um, but we're looking at all of these, how all of these different um, disturbances, linkages, patterns, uh, elements and flows, how they influence the landscape. And so we're really trying to look at it from a, a 20,000 foot view. 
um, the Ranger District, the interdisciplinary team, and the collaborative worked through this, this process. It took us about a year, um, but we worked collaboratively through this process. Um, and you can go to the next slide. We focused on a few different landscape themes. So like I said, today we're mostly focused on kind of the grass, the grasslands part. Um, and but we had themes of vegetation, wildlife habitat, the aquatics, including the physical environment, humans, and fire. Next slide. And as we um, as we looked at this, the patterns and and this landscape, we were trying really to zoom out and look at you know what do we want in the future? What's our desired um, future condition here? And some of the things, the goals and objectives we came up with were allowing natural processes to, to flow where possible, um, to restore and promote um, serial stage distribution to reflect natural disturbance patterns. And so um, we did a lot of, of learning sessions. I think we had um, probably five to 10 field trips and learning sessions with the um, interdisciplinary team and the Rigdon Collaborative with people like, like James and, and Bart and uh, Tanya and others to learn more about this area and with some of our Forest Service specialists. Next slide. Something that was really important to, um, to us was what can we what can we learn from Jim's Creek? It was, it was set up as a study area, as a, as a pilot area. And um, how is what we've done there? How can we carry that over to the larger region landscape? Um, what are some lessons learned? And, um, and then getting to know more of the region landscape. So that's a lot of the work that you'll see from Bart and James here today. Next slide. So I think um, I think Bart is going to talk more about kind of lessons learned. Um, I can talk a little bit about challenges. Um, you know, so this forest has grown in. It um, it has a lot of uh, old growth dependent species um, that we are managing for, like northern spotted owl has. Um, a lot of land management allocations that are more biased towards maintaining older forests and not um, early seral forests. And so we really want to prioritize and, and do work where, where, we, where we really need to. Um, and then capacity and funding to, to, to introduce fire um, on a regular basis if we're trying to mimic kind of that, that regime. And Sarah, I don't know if you wanna turn it back over to Bart now for his slides. We can't Sounds, do it. Ready, Bart? Sounds good. Yeah, if I can just share my screen. Sounds like you can make colors, that'd be great. Okay, I think I can do that here. Let me just get to the right place. So definitely want to uh, build off what both Molly and James were talking about and some of the lessons we've been learning at Jim's Creek. So I'm going to draw on a number of studies with a number of collaborators, including this, where uh, I was collaborating with Jane Curtis, Scott Bridge, and a colleague here at the University of Oregon, and Jenny Lippert. And in that project, we're actually studying seven sites throughout the middle and southern Willamette Valley. And the one in the very lower left is Jim's Creek. And you'll notice again that it's quite in a very different location than sort of most of the classic expectations for an oak savanna. And in fact, if I were to overlay on this a map of the Willamette Valley ecoregion, which was dominated historically by prairies and grasslands, as much as 70% of the Willamette Valley floor and foothills were uh, prairie, wetland prairie, upland prairie, and oak savanna just 150 years ago. Jim's Creek's an outlier in that sense. It's not an outlier in many other ways, but it's a very different kind of forest. And again, I think the expectations that there was Native American indigenous management up there have changed dramatically with Jim's Creek and other sites like it. 
I want to note that in Jim's Creek, I'm going to go through quite a few slides quickly. I apologize for that because I don't want to take too much time here, but there's quite a bit to tell so I can get to some of the key lessons that I think are up for grabs. We ought to be talking about a lot late in the coming years here. The first though is that at Jim's Creek, we're zooming in, you can see that those meadows that were there in 2005 before the treatments were done were relatively stable over the last 60 years or so. You can see there's been a fair bit of infill. They maybe lost 30% of the side as site of their sides as conifers filled in. But there are good reasons, as we'll get into, why those meadows maintain there with their oaks, oaks on the edges, sometimes oaks in the center, and then oaks in the forest matrix, but mostly as James showed you, mostly dead oaks. We set up at the side, you can tell by the blue color of this, how ancient this study was. This is an air photo from back in 1997. And in the Jim's Creek boundary in orange, you can see we set up five uh, stratified random transects. And along each transect, we studied, we documented, we mapped, we measured all what we call the target trees, conifers that were greater than 75 centimeters in diameter. So a little under a meter, about three foot in diameter and then all oaks because oaks were fairly rare up there. And in addition to those long belt transects, we also sampled every 30 meters, 200 square meter plots with intensive data on soils, on ground layer of vegetation, on tree density, measuring all the trees. So we essentially work with these continuous transects about three kilometers of them across Jim's Creek. I'm, again, I'm gonna give you the main messages of some of these figures here because I don't want you to spend too much time and looking at them. What this basically says here is that when we sampled all these trees at Jim's Creek, put all that data together, that in fact, with these tree histograms, we show by species and by size class. So smaller trees on the left, bigger trees on the right, that of those plots that we sampled, the large majority, 31 of them were dense forest, over 60% canopy. About 15 were closed woodland, a little bit less canopy, a little bit more oak and cedar mixed in, uh, forest meadow edges, and then prairie and pine savanna. So the vast majority of the site was forest. But what was it before? And again, what you can see is that not surprisingly, most of the trees are small. Well, if you look over on the left there, you see some of these legacy trees, the kinds that James talked about with that large now dead oak that Tim's by, sugar pine, ponderosa pine, and then a large dug fir that's not to scale there. And as we recorded them, you can see in that little chart there that of all the target trees we recorded, almost more than half of the tree oaks were dead. There were logs in the ground, there were snags standing in the air. Out of the 57, only 22 were alive. Ponderosa pine, about half of them, a little under half, were already dead, of these large, big ponderosas. Um, a couple sugar pines, they were still alive, and the dug fir, almost all alive. They, don't, they do fine under denser forest conditions. Callus cedars, decurrence, incense cedar, the same thing. The, those two graphs at the bottom there, what they're essentially showing is we did a lot of work to try to estimate which of those trees that we were sampling were older than 150 years old. So we call them pre-settlement trees, purportedly pre-settlement trees. And we mapped the density of those trees. Now these are large preset, we would have been large enough to be still evident either as a live tree, a dead tree, or a log on the ground. And you can see that in that reconstruction there, most of the plots are 30 meter plots. We would have expected to have had no trees. It's a prairie. A number of them had what we call savanna densities, one to five to six to 15 trees per acre and very little evidence when you removed all those little trees like the ones James showed, that there was actually much area that was dense forest. The current tree density, however, is then on the right there. You see that many of these plots had 200 to over 300 trees per acre. That's the infill of those young dug firs that came in after the fire regime slowed down, the ones that James was talking about. We did some, re we've done a fair bit of aging and coring of trees. This basically just shows on the left that most of the trees are young. Most of the trees are less than 125 years old. And you note on the right there that the older trees that are over that age, we got a fair distribution, small numbers, but of oaks, incense cedar, ponderosa pine, and dug firs. And when we actually do some density core analysis, we're basically stimulating when was the regeneration happening there. 
you can see that for all species there, at least the ponderosa, well, the dug fir and the calisutus decurrence, they pretty much mostly come in starting about 125 years ago. There's an explosion of regeneration. The, the oaks, you'll note that at the same time, their regeneration goes down after an initial peak. And then you see the ponderosa pine, it does peak in recent times, but it was pretty consistent over time. So again, the process has been one of the infill of Douglas fir and incense cedar in among those old remnant trees, just like James and I and Molly have even shown you. What happened to the oaks? Well, we, I developed an index of measuring crown loss by estimating these large limbs that were either present or you could see broken off and the limb scars left. So we were estimating the extent of the original canopy of primary, secondary, tertiary limbs and branches and twigs that have been lost. And the figure down on the left, lower left there, says that uh, many of them had, you can see the numbers of 100% crown loss. Basically, basically means it's dead, it's a log or it's a standing snag. You can see that almost all the oaks had had substantial encroachment on their crowns, they're losing limbs. There's just sort of skeletons of them left there. And overall in the landscape, you saw this real pattern that there were these dry, shallow to bedrock meadows. They're extremely droughty during the summer, like those one showing in the spring and then in the summer on the upper right, where it's just really difficult for a tree to get established. You can see then on the lower right, these meadow transition areas, th those are the ones that infilled on those earlier photos I showed you, where Douglas fir and pine are coming to the edges, but the oaks are persisting on those edges of meadows as well. And then these areas of dense dug for info, like the one on the lower left. So sort of three basic types. But there are more nuances that we'll get into as we look forward here. 2008 to about 2011, we had a, a, a work to both combine restoration techniques with logging, trying to remove those young trees. Based on our recommendations, all dug firs less than 20 inches in diameter removed. Um, Pines were left alone, all pines were left, and all oaks were left, which was a fairly straightforward prescription that the contractors could follow. And we'll talk more about that. Since then, there's been a number of work to bring back prescribed fire there. Some of it has burned very gently on the land, and some has burned perhaps more intensely than was intended. So there is a real challenge on a site like this. It's so dry, so hot, and so steep to get a fire burning just the way you want it to burn. So I made this slide back before or right after the harvest. And to me, it was the idea was that the easy part might be thin in the trees. Forest service is pretty good at that. Loggers are pretty good at that, thin in the trees. It's not easy. You've got to work not to damage the trees that you're trying to leave in place, but you can cut them. But what happens on the ground layer? And for a variety of reasons, uh, one, I think this was certainly not the Forest Service standard practice to do ground layer restoration at that time. There was also a challenge of just not having enough, enough native seed to be propagated to uh, seed out in, uh, a site of this size of over 400 acres. And in addition, there was a fair bit of faith in some parties that the California fescue, one of the major bunch grasses there, would regenerate on its own as it had in some of the clear cuts that had been done before. And as we'll see later, that happened in some places and not in others. So this takes those diagrams before on the lower left and the center of what had been our reconstruction of the historical tree density, the current tree density in 2005, and then this is what it looked like after thinning. So you can see we did not move it back aggressively toward the what were apparently pre-settlement conditions, uh, but it moved quite a bit back in that direction. Very few areas had over 100 trees per acre. There are a lot in the range from open meadows with no trees to up to 26 to 50 trees per acre. So I think it was really a success in that way. And frankly, some of us thought it was too light a thinning. They left too many pines. It was really dense. There wasn't much savanna there. It was a lot of woodland. Um, by 2015, 2015, the last time we completed analysis, results were looking about on target. Um, we had seen here, this is canopy cover on these different plots, the former prairie, the former savanna, oak woodland, closed woodland and forest. And you can see that canopy cover was reduced from around 50 to 60% in the woodland and forest down to about 
a lot of information here, but the basic message is, is that most of the target trees, the large target trees, the conifers, the oaks, the pines, the dug firs had survived. There was a certain amount of mortality. One of the hardest things was actually relocating a lot of the trees after the landscape was so completely transformed. We would, we would get lost out there. We couldn't find our way around. And we were clambering over a lot of logging slash and a lot of other items that hadn't been there before. Well, but what's happened now? We've been out uh, again this last year to sample the ground layer, the herbaceous vegetation, and also the canopy layer. And it's a real mixed picture. And that's what I want to talk about last with you here. So some of these areas like this meadow that you can see there's a border of sort of thin trees around it. That was an infilled meadow. That was dense forest around the edge. Those trees in the center and around the edges are doing fine now. I think really achieved the objectives there. This is an area that worked really well. The thin in theory, you can see a person for scale there in among some of these large ponderosa pines and a few dug firs that are still in place there. And at least in the canopy layer, it's doing fairly well. The ground layer is a different story. And you can see areas where, for instance, here's one of those large oaks that was on the edge of an earth flow. And we'll talk about more of that later. I've sort of sketched around what probably was this historical crown if you take those large branch, scar branch scars and extend their limbs out. And it's healthy, it's surviving. It's probably never going to recover certainly that crown that it had before, but it's in pretty good shape. It was a very large oak growing and looking happy. This is one of those meadow oaks. It was a half mushroom shaped meadow oak. The side on the left was up against dense trees. You can see some stumps right there. On the right hand, it was reaching out with those full branches over into the meadow. It's doing well. It has what we call epicormic sprouting coming off of the stems, it's starting to regenerate some of its crown. And many of the smaller oaks look like they're doing very well. Here's another example, one of those meadow edges. These were oaks that were surviving on the meadow edges as compared to ones in the middle of the dense forest that were dead. And they're doing well, they're healthy. And you can see the, prayer, the meadow has been expanded, the meadow or the savanna has been expanded around them there. Again, some of these oaks, young oaks are doing extremely vigorous epicormic sprouting. I never expected to see epicormic sprouts that actually turn into what are beginning to turn into limbs on the oaks. So the small oaks that are continuing to grow larger and bigger are doing a fair bit of canopy regeneration. And that's different than the big oaks that are simply not able to grow much taller. They're not creating new canopies like the young ones are. So things are looking good in that sense for the future. Here's an area, the tree on the right actually is completely alive. It just hasn't leafed out again this spring. You can see on the left in 2005, there is an oak on the ridge top with over 100 dug firs growing underneath its canopy, just soon ready to kill it. You can see it on the right there, doing fine. It's actually growing, it's regenerating. However, that's not the case all over the site. This is one of the oaks, the big open grown oaks that was right in the middle of a wet, steepy meadow. It was doing fine. There was no trees immediately thinned around it, but you can see on the right that quite a true few trees were thinned uphill, and it's just barely hanging on for life now. Was it the end of its life period? Was it because it was thinned and that opened up the nearby canopy to dry out the soils and perhaps cut off some of the seeping moisture that was coming to it? Or was it just the 2015 drought? We're really doing forensic evidence out there that we'll get some lessons, but a lot of this will be hard to deconvolve. There's quite a few of the target trees. Some of them are alive, but many of the large ones are dying. Is it because it got too harsh and dry when you open them up to more wind and exposure? Or is it because they're almost dead when you thin them? I was watching the ponderosa pines dying between measurements before the thinning. They were under extreme stress. So part of the lesson may be that open up these very stressed ponderosa pines and then them being exposed to the wind and the sun and the drought can be really detrimental to a lot of them. They're just many of them are dying. And in addition, many of them are falling over. Some real concerns about that. You can see here evidence of a 2016 blowdown. It was an uncommon, very powerful east wind event that pushed against the trees in a direction that they didn't have the root support to stand up. So there was an enormous amount of blowdown. You can see the trees that are sort of lined up with that wind. I don't know what wind direction the wind came from, except the trees are telling me which way it came from. And so much of that area that looked too thick, it's a lot more open now. It's really been thinned out. This is a picture of James holding up one of the very 
pitchy pines that we have there. James mentioned the peeling of the bark for food or medicine. It also seems quite likely that they were peeling some of the beer to get pitch that would be used as a glue, for instance, binding uh, an arrowhead with rawhide to an arrow shaft. And this very high fire regime that James discovered up there about every three years at Jim's Creek. Again, just looking at some of the, excuse me, my timer letting me know to hurry up. Uh, intense fire scars that are on here. James might do a better job than me, but I did my best stab at where those fire scars were on one of these pines we were looking at. And now let's look at the ground layer, right? Mixed results in the canopy. Young oaks doing well, some of the old oaks doing well, others dying, a lot of die off on some of the big ponderosa pines, firs doing well, blowdown coming ha happening. Here you see a line that on the left was one of those remnant meadows and on the right, it was thinned. You can see that on the left, maybe you can't see, but I can because I've been up there measuring it, that that is incredibly diverse. Forbs, five native bunch grasses, lots of diverse forbs, a very rich, very high quality prairie. On the right-hand side, right nearby, where you might've thought those seeds would blow, it's almost all invasive annual grasses. This was not a seeded site, and that invasive annual grass dominance is true throughout much of Jim's Creek, particularly on the drier, hotter sites like you see here. In other areas, you did see that vigorous regeneration of California fescue on some music areas. It is, I've never seen a dominant, it be dominant like this. California fescue hides in the shade down the Willamette Valley floor, but up there in the cooler elevations, it does extremely well. And you can see it where it regenerated on the more music areas on its own with no seeding. On the other hand, here's one of the hot dry sites that for those of you who don't know it is called Sinosaurus echinatus. It's a major Mediterranean annual invasive grass and it is extraordinarily dominant here. There's a few native grasses coming up through it, but it's been almost that, that savanna or that prairie out there now is almost completely dominated by invasive annual grasses. And once they've multiplied by like this, the seed bank is extraordinary, very, very difficult to get it away from that. So the lack of seeding was a real issue in some places. Similarly, I want to show this lovely picture of Ceanothus intergerimus there, blooming this spring. It's a lovely shrub. And yet in most places, that wasn't the intended prescription. It was not to create a shrubby ground layer. It was to create a grassland, much as we believe most of the site was before. And so there's a challenge here because I've just shown you the Ceanothus. There is a hot, dry site that is dominated by those invasive annual grasses. And the challenges right now that we're seeing there is with too little fire, it turns into a Ceanothus thicket. Trees aren't regenerated under it. There's no grasses under it. We wade over that stuff up to our heads sometimes because not enough fires come in there. And yet when you put fire into the system there, you start to see that much of the regeneration of the young trees that are coming back are dead. Now, you're trying to suppress succession, we also want a new generation of trees to come in. Remember those old trees are dying. You have to look to the future here. And it's a pretty tough task to keep out the dug firs from coming in, but to not kill all the ponderosa pines and the oaks. This is happening in many cases where they're being top killed by the fires. Meanwhile, on the right, you see one of these fairly dry sites that was unseated, uh, totally taken over by the invasive annuals. And although it's not really easy to see in that picture on the lower right there, that's actually one of the areas we had 20 seeded plots. And we've seen that the Romer's fescue that was seeded in there is doing quite well. Ironically, they attempted to seed in California fescue. Unfortunately, the collectors collected uh, tall fescue, which is a invasive pasture grass. And that was seeded out with the Romer's fescue instead of California fescue. But we've actually using that now as an experiment to see where the Romer's fescue does well versus the tall fescue. And so the interesting stories we're seeing the Romer's fescue doing really, really well on the dry sites and out competing the Shadonris. On the moist sites where it was seeded in, the Shadonris is out competing the Romer's. The Shadonris is the tall fescue. And then on some of the more music sites, you've got California, mescue, California fescue mixed in. In some cases, it's, it's out, completing, out competing the tall fescue. So it's a pretty complex picture of what's going on up there. And what I want to shift to for the last part is how we think about this spatially. 
right? And that maybe understanding in space why things are happening differently in different areas is the key to how we think about the restoration and the future management up there. So I want to note that last year was a kind of moist spring. We had fescue tillers over six foot tall on some of these mess areas. This is a large seed. And although there's no direct evidence that I've read of the indigenous peoples harvesting California fescue, there are from in California, from Idaho, Montana, there's evidence that among the different seeds that were being collected, that fescues were among them. And so this may well have been one of those culturally managed plants where the fire regime was being targeted toward producing fescue and fescue seeds, perhaps fescue as well for basketry. You're getting a lot of benefit out of that fescue. It's just a keystone species in the system here. And you can see the elk browse on the one above it. The elk love those California fescue. And there is a sparrow nest between uh, a bunch grass there, a bunch of the fescue. Really important to have these grass and birds that are nesting habitat. And that's what the bunch grasses provide. So there's a lot of reasons why these restoring these savannas matters, not just at Jim's Creek, but across these lowland Pacific Northwest. I've listed a bunch of biodiversity values on the left, but there's also some key cultural values, such as indigenous people's uses, aesthetic recreational values, and a real ecocultural heritage. And I think part of what we look at going forward is how do we link our knowledge of both of those values and needs, the biodiversity values, and the cultural values toward doing a better job of restoring these sites. And so I wanna to turn to the final, just some ideas to leave you with about tending and cultivation and areas that have been explored. And I think we have to be thoughtful in how we look at them. We have to acknowledge that there are climatic regimes and natural fire regimes that are working the land on their own, but also really understand the ways in which indigenous people manage the land, particularly in sites we find like Jim's Creek and as Jim said, James said, a large area of land that appears to have had quite intensive indigenous management over time, and that perhaps we're failing in our restoration because we don't have sufficient cultural and site-specific knowledge that they did over those perhaps 200 generations of management. Uh, Tony Farquet, who is an archaeologist of the Sweet Home District, talks about the Kalapuya as the economists of the Northwest. Happy to talk more about why, but the extensive trade networks they had, their production of camas, their production of different foods was quite an extraordinary economic development. These are some slides from uh, work by Cat Anderson in California, but understanding the different ways in which the oaks were used, the complex management that was very, very fine tuned in how you used and managed these trees. And in particular, some of these sketches and ideas and documentation in her work with both anthropologists and indigenous people about the practices and the nuances of how these savannas were managed by indigenous peoples, whether it was preparing the, with the fires, managing the grassland, managing the oaks themselves. And not just the ground layer, not just the trees, but also the ground layer, the ways that bulbs such as camas and other plants were tended, were replanted, things were reseeded for productive uses as first foods. And so I come back to some of these ideas about that the sophistication of our restoration has not been sufficient yet in my mind to get anywhere near matching what was likely the sophistication, not just of the basket making, but of the fire management of indigenous peoples. And that proposition I made you that if their people were this sophisticated in their cultural use and processing and artistry of the work with the products of these savannas, they probably were pretty darn articulate in their management of them. And so my last question to you is, wouldn't you just expect that cultures with such sophisticated collection and processing of acorns and other foodstuffs would have similar sophisticated nuances used as a fire to manage the oak and grass and habitats. And perhaps that's where we're not anywhere near sophisticated enough. So what uh, I'm working on with two graduate students now is this idea of we can't replace that local site scale knowledge that the indigenous people had. Many of the indigenous people who can help now are overtaxed by their burdens of working on so many projects and so much land now. And so much knowledge has also been lost but maybe we can gain more site-specific knowledge of what I'll call physiographic site units of what grows well where 
and what you can you produce in those areas. And so at gyms now, we're trying to adopt this idea of looking at different site units based on physiographic, topographic soils to understand why and where these matrix oaks grew in among what turned into a forest on these richer productive sites where they grew fast and big, understanding the places such as earth flows that were good persistent places for oaks over time, droughty vernal swales, understanding where the shallow soil wet meadows were that produced abundant seeds and flowers and different species, understand where those dry meadows were and actually begin to develop different prescriptions for those different sites, particularly those that might emphasize some of the first foods and the productive areas for the oaks and for the California fescue. So we're looking at a lot of different data and data layers and trying to plot again, where should we use different management, management regimes and how can we make it much more sophisticated in what we target for each of those areas. There is an area to the east of Jim's Creek, sorry if the last slides here are falling apart a little bit, but um, where we have very similar conditions. And at least at this point now, my recommendations would be a much, much softer hand up there of triage around these large old trees, the CMTs, the old pines, working around the edges of the meadows, learning from the things that have worked well and those that have not at Jim's Creek and taking a lot more care and attention to the ground layer in particular. So with that, I want to just end with a thought about that perhaps our sort of industrial scale restoration in the last 35 years that we're learning has a long ways to go before it reaches the kind of sophistication we need for the site. But that what we really have to do at Jim's Creek and the others is not just look to protecting these legacy trees, but how do we get the sophistication of management for the next generation of trees for the next 100 to 200 to 400 years. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Sarah or Molly. Great, thanks Bart. Yep, I'm gonna hand it back to Molly and share my screen back to our presentation. And then I'll bring you Molly. All right, well, thanks Bart. I think um, Bart and I have been doing a lot of, a lot of talking as we, as we look at the post uh, Jim's Creek area. I was able to go out in the field a few times. Um, and I'm gonna kind of take all of you to where, where we're headed next. And so this rigged and landscape analysis area, um, there's a, a slide of it here. The first project um, we're going to do is Young's Rock Rigdon that we're proposing to do. Next slide. So the Young's Rock Rigdon area is really, um, we chose that because it is centered in the mixed conifer area. Um, and here's a few pictures uh, showing some of that diversity that, that we've been talking about today. Um, the dry meadow on the right is in the Young's Rock area. It has milkweed and monarchs, uh, very thin soils, oaks. Um, and then over on the left is actually a higher elevation site, um, very wet meadow. And you can kind of see the pattern of the landscape out there in the, in the picture. Next slide. So the Young's Rock Rigdon project um, is going to be the first project out of that landscape analysis but really um, using what we've learned and what we're still learning in the Jim's Creek and uh, greater Rigdon area from people like Bart and James um, and working in a collaborative way to come up with some, some different ways of, of doing restoration. Um, a lot of what you just heard Bart talk about here. So um, the Young's Rock Rigdon area is pretty large. Um, we're not proposing treatments in the whole 33,000 acres, um, but that's, that's the extent of it. Um, and we'll be using the landscape analysis as we, to, uh, to what we're proposing. And then some of those details about prescriptions, um, we're really trying to, to learn, to use what we've learned. Next slide. So um, this is the summary of the proposal, pretty, um, pretty broad here and uh, definitely more in-depth um, things to come. Um, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. And really it has been a collaborative process with um, Bart and James and the rest of the collaborative um, planning what we wanna do on this landscape. What have we learned? Um, 
what do we want to see in the future? And I think uh, Bart talks about, you know, taking a long view. Um, what do we want to see there, not just immediately afterwards or even five, 10 years afterwards, but what do we want that landscape to look like in a hundred years? And what's the best way for us to, um, to get there? So um, the next project after Young's Rock is Steeple Rock Rigden, and, and that's a little different of a project and then Dome, Dome Rock Rigden. Um, there's a really good uh, story map that the Forest Service and the Collaborative worked on together. I put the um, the link there. You can also check it out and more about the Rigdon project as a whole on the um, Southern Willamette Forest Collaborative website. Um, we will be releasing the Young's Rock Rigdon draft EIS probably at the end of this week, just coincidental timing to this talk um, and look forward to getting those comments uh, back on the project and then um, coming up with our, our proposal. Next slide. So, um, so that's kind of the end of our formal presentation. Um, I think we have some time for, for questions. Um, and so I guess I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Sarah to facilitate that. All right, thanks, Molly. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we knew we had a lot to cover uh, in this talk. So what we um, wanted to do is focus on being able to share with you guys the uh, findings from the studies that both uh, Bart and James have been working on. So we did go a little bit long, but right now we only have a handful of questions that we see um, on the question and answer. So I think we'll take some time to go through those. And then if we get those all answered, maybe Sally can help me in moderating um, uh, other question and answers. So I think what I'll do, is that sound correct, uh, Sally? Just read off the questions and then hand it to whoever of our panelists can help answer it best. Yep, exactly. Okay, great. So we have a question here from Douglas Goldenberg. It seems relatively easy to get rid of excess conifer, but hard to prevent conversion to non-native grasses and noxious weeds. Any problems or successes with all of that? And I think, Bart, you really hit on that with um, the second half of your presentation, but any comments that you'd like to add or any other panelists? Sure, sure. Let's give me a quick one there. So again, we have fairly limited experience with what happened with seed, and I think some of us were pretty skeptical that we could get a good ground layer going without seeding up there. And in fact, a particular on those drier sites, you just really need the seeding. It's not surprisingly turned into invasive exotics there. It was impressive how well the California fescue has done in some areas where it was still residual under the soil. You could see it in the forest floor and those plants were able to regenerate and then start sending out seed. But I think in those middle ground areas and the hot dry areas, when they're thin, they really need seed. I don't see any way around it. We have not seen much movement of the meadow plants into those areas yet. Great, thanks, Bart. And I think the one thing we'll add to that is that the collaborative um, has been discussing ways to uh, use some of our good neighbor authority or stewardship dollars to fund some of the propagation of these seeds. So still working on that as a process. Um, if no one else is coming on mute, I'll go to the next question. All right, next question from Sue Wright. Regarding the fire intervals, there's no way to determine the source, i.e. natural causes or intentional human causes of these intervals, correct? James, I think that's probably a question for you. There's probably some clever ways to tease out the extent of natural versus anthropogenic ignitions that are kind of complicated, but the short answer to that question is, Correct. The fire scar evidence in tree rings itself isn't a basis for that inference. Maybe I can just add that one way we've talked about doing that is really cross-dating work the dates of the fires compared to the climate signal to see if, in fact, you find that the dates of the fires are disconnected to the hottest, drier its years. And that would be some evidence on that side, but it's a very difficult one to tease out. Great, thanks. Next question, I think also for you, James, um, from Ralph Coopersmith. On your last slide, uh, I thought he said that fires were still fairly frequent, but the mean fire return interval was 55 years. Is that correct? The mean fire return intervals that we have reconstructed at 16 sites that range in elevation from about 1,500 to 5,500 feet range from 
two years to about 200 years. Um, so there's quite a bit of variety, but in those old growth Western hemlock, Douglas fir stands, it's between 30 and 60 years. You have to get really high up into true fir sites with persistent snowpack into June to get into fire return intervals that are more than 100 years. And almost all of the sites in that area, the longest fire-free interval is the last one. That is to say between the late 1800s and the present day. If I could just add briefly, I think the last two questions are really on target. I mean, this is not easy stuff to tease out. One of the other things we are doing, I think is, is sort of embedded in what James and I were talking about, is that the areas with these frequent fire regimes tend to be associated with cultural artifacts like the CMTs and also with culturally managed plants such as the oaks. So we're seeing spatial overlap in these areas and trying to, it's not cause and effect, but it certainly is an association which is making a lot of sense to some people. Particularly when you talk to the native people and ask them, what were you doing with fire? How were you using fire? Great, thanks. Next uh, question from uh, Devin McMahon. Did the project have specific desired conditions for grass herb species composition post-treatment and were they met? And then the, any issues with invasive species, which I think you did answer, Mark. Well, yes, the, the hopeful desired condition was to have um, native a native understory of uh, uh, grasses and forbs um, and some and some shrubs. Um, and so as Bart's um, monitoring has shown, research has shown, you know, we have more annual invasives in those areas than we would like to um, at this time. So I think um, really, as Bart said, figuring out the, the understory component is really what we've been, um, what we've been working on as we move into the larger Rigdon area. And it looks like Bart might have something to say about that too. Uh, I think you've covered it pretty well, and we talked about it before. Where we there has been seeding up there across the spectrum from mesic sites to much drier sites, the perennials that were seeded in are doing quite well, and the annual invasives are not dominating. It's in the areas that were not seeded, particularly the hotter, drier areas, and where there's been prescribed fire. So you're you're stuck. You don't put in prescribed fire, you get a Ceanothus thicket. You put in prescribed fire without seeding, you can be killing off the regeneration that you might want to replace those dead trees. And it's very difficult for the perennials to get established on their own there compared to those invasive exotics with their really fast reproductive rates. Great, thanks. Uh, this one probably is a question from you, for you, Molly, from um, Sue Wright. How did the private landowners react to the desired treatments of the area? And was there any pushback? Um, the, most of the private land around there is industrial timberland. Um, They've been a part of the, the collaborative and um, there hasn't been any pushback about any of those treatments. Um, I think we've actually, they've actually been pretty on board with the treatments that have been done. Um, and we're not in the Jim's Creek area, we're not um, really next to private land, but in the larger uh, rigged and landscape area um, in some of our areas, we are right up in, against uh, private timber lands and some of the treatments there also um, make it easier for us to uh, stop fires from private going to public land or public land going to private land. So they've been very um, supportive of those efforts. Great, thanks. Um, and we have maybe one or two more questions before I hand it back to uh, Sally. So we'll go to a question from Chandra Lagui. Um, Bartman just said, Bart just said how we have a lot to learn as we look to apply things to a larger landscape. How do we ensure this sort of adaptive management is done carefully and at appropriate scales? Not too big, not too small, so we can adapt treatments before doing too much that might be in the wrong direction. I, can, I guess I can uh, answer that. So uh, Chandra, as you know, we, we don't, um, it takes us a long time to, to get from planning our projects to implementing them. Um, Bart mentioned the area just east of Jim's Creek um, that's part of the Young's Rock Rigdon area. And I think that's an area we can really take some of these lessons learned um, and, 
and try some different things out there and and use those to adapt as we go. So I think um, we just need to make sure we're, we're we keep working closely um, with our with our partners and and seeing what we do on the landscape. Um, the lessons that I think we've learned in Jim's Creek are most applicable in the Young's Rock Ridge area on those kind of south facing slopes with the um, with the oak and pine. And so I think um, we just need to be mindful and 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 watch and see what the results are as we um, treat those areas. Just add a small bit there. I think one of the challenges at Jim's Creek. I mean, it was a very thoughtfully constructed project, and it really was. An alliance and a collaboration between uh, local citizens, forest service, conservationists, loggers. I think it's really hard to go into this without having an almost exclusively restoration focus on these. I just think that has to be the priority. And that I would certainly recommend that future projects like this be approached much more sensitive to that. Now, there had to be a lot of trees removed to Jim's Creek to, to, to take out what people believed was needed, including me. And it's really difficult to do that gentle on the ground. I think we have to be a lot more gentle with this. And I, the other lesson I just want to put in there is I think it's those music areas that were the quickest to succeed and lose all the oaks and all the firs and all the ground layer that are perhaps the most important to go back into because in those areas, the difference between on the dry sites, this is a, an oak this big around is 400 years old. And on those music sites, an oak this big around, you can't even see my hands on the screen now in 400 years or 200 years. So these productive sites that can grow the California fescue, that can be dominant and grow those big oaks quickly from seedling is really important. And in some of those music areas at Jim's Creek, you're seeing those young oaks doing very, very well. So I think it's, it's the nuance is how do you get a fire regime into an area with young oaks without top killing them? And I honestly think I'm going way beyond any data. I'm retired. I can say whatever the heck I want to right now is that indigenous people knew how to use the cool fires very, very carefully. And I am just so impressed with how it was possible to maintain those matrix oaks in the middle of the productive fuel with the tall grasses, the heavy fuel loads that so easily penetrate, heat up the bark and can top kill an oak. It takes a lot of sophistication to use it. And it's hard to do when you're not living on the land and wake up one morning and saying, you know what, let's burn today. Well, let's wait another day. Let's burn tomorrow. It's a challenge without people on the land. All right, thanks, Bart. I think I'll probably leave it there. There's still a couple uh, questions, but maybe our panelists can stay on for an extra minute or two for the 20 minutes afterwards, if these folks still wanna answer them. Um, but I just really wanna thank everyone for uh, taking your time out of a day after a holiday to be here and hear about um, this landscape. And I'll hand it back. Oh, and, and I want to say thank you very much to the panelists <laughs> um, and being here today. And I'll hand it back over to Sally. Thank you. And thank you. Thank all of our panelists for presenting. It's a super cool project. So I'm really excited you guys shared it with us. Um, let me just share my screen one more time. Oh, man. There we go. So, um, our next session will be on August 4th. Um, it's called Old Growth on the East Side. Uh, if you want more information on this series, if you have questions, you wanna sign up for more updates, please visit our website and you can sign up there and you can see what else is on the list for this workshop. Um, and if you have any other questions that are not answered on our website, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, my email address is at the bottom here. So with that, I'm gonna open up breakout rooms for anyone who wants to stay and chat for the next, um, let's see, 20 minutes or so, so at like roughly 250. Um, you're welcome to, these are not